Good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming here tonight. Thank you for joining us. This is a very special moment for us, and it's the prelude to the inauguration of the show that we are presenting to the public, and it will be opened as from tomorrow, and it's called uh, Motion, Autos, Art and Architecture, and it's a show that uh, is uh, celebrating the 25th anniversary of the museum, and uh, which for us as a museum, and as I said, it's a very special occasion. It's a wonderful opportunity. It's a unique opportunity to present a story that we believe is highly relevant for our audience. It's the history of the automobile, but not only from the point of view of automobiles as a means of uh, motion, but rather from the artistic dimension and also in its uh, connection with other disciplines that show the creativity of man with uh, painting, sculpture, etc. And this is a project that mm, was uh, initially designed by Lord Norman Foster, and I don't have to introduce him to the audience in Bilbao. And this is a project in which the museum has been collaborating very intensely with the Norman Foster Foundation, and for us, as I say, it's a great privilege to open as from tomorrow in the uh, program of 2022 this show, this motion show. And it's a project that's not only special for the program of the museum, but also because I believe that it represents a landmark. Because what it does, it presents a story that perhaps, or a history, well, perhaps uh, many of you still remember the exhibition, The Art of the Motorcycle, that we had in 1999, but that goes beyond that exhibition. And it's an exhibition that is much more ambitious because it does not only review the evolution of the motorcycle, in that case, and of automobiles now, but it also explores other things like uh, other artistic uh, disciplines and the connection with our world. And it ends with a reflection on the future, a gallery called The Future, where 15 teams from 15 schools and uh, universities from four continents present at the museum their visions on what they think mobility would be like towards uh, 2086 when automobiles uh, reach their second centenary. So here, as an introduction to this exhibition, we have a luxury panel, and they're going to hold a conversation before our audience. And this is, I think, is, uh, well, thanks, taking place thanks to the generosity of uh, Norman Elena and the Foundation, or the Norman Foster Foundation, but it's also thanks to the many people that have uh, loaned these works, uh, private loaners, and here on behalf of them we have three of the most significant uh, lenders, and that is Merle, Merle Mullin, Everett Lohman, and Philip Safarim. And a fourth person is here with us today because Norman, well, his foundation is uh, also has also loaned her works, and we have uh, with us Deca Hila Waldoner, who, with uh, Maro Thiroki and Norman Foster, have been the curators of this exhibition, and uh, they are going to hold a conversation here. And I'm sure that uh, you're all going to find that it's fascinating. So, without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to Leka, who's going to uh, play the role of moderator in this uh, conversation. And once again, many thanks to the four people that are on stage with us here tonight. Thank you very much for making this possible. Well, thank you very much and welcome. Uh, the audience that is here and also those of you who are joining us streaming. We had a great response to tonight's program. So we know that everyone that wanted to attend wasn't able to be right here, but we're glad that we'll, we'll be able to include this on our website and uh, that this conversation will have a longer life than just the one hour that we get today. Um, as Juan Ignacio said, I'm joined here with an exceptional group of uh, lenders who have very generously supported motion, autos, art, and architecture. The exhibition that we're so pleased to open to the public tomorrow. This has been a huge effort on the part of Norman Foster Foundation and Lord Norm Norman Foster himself, and also the Guggenheim Museum. Uh, we've been hard at work on this for years. And so we are really excited to be opening the doors finally and letting all of you in to see this hard work. So before we get started, I, uh, there are a lot of different elements that are very important to this exhibition. 
the title suggests that, but we, we must say that the cars act as the protagonists of the discourse that this exhibition presents. And um, as such, the, the exhibition design displays that the cars are at the center of each gallery. And there is a selection of 38 uh, different vehicles that have been made very carefully because of their rarity, their beauty, and also their technical innovation. So today, we are going to talk about a few of those cars. We're not gonna get into the art so much today, a little bit more uh, into the cars. And um, I'd like to start by introducing uh, our guests tonight so that you can sort of situate them. I'm gonna go right down the line and then we'll begin talking about the cars um, that they've lent to the exhibition. So uh, to my left here, I have Averett Lauman, who is a Dutch collector. He's the founder of the Lauman Museum and the chairman of the Lauman Group. The new building of his museum, which opened in 2010, displays about 260 cars, ranging from veteran and vintage motor cars, sports and racing cars, as well as luxury cars, cycle cars, bubble cars, and even a few fire engines. And there's probably more to tell, but we'll keep it at that for the moment. Next down the line, I have Lord Norman Foster. Um, who established Foster Associates in 1967, which has evolved into Foster and Partners, where he con continues as the executive chairman. Norman Foster also has the Madrid-based foundation called the Norma Norman Foster Foundation, which promotes interdisciplinary thinking and research to help new generations of architects, designers, and urbanists anticipate the future. The foundation believes in the importance of connecting architecture, design, technology, and the arts to better serve society and in value of a holistic education that encourages experimentation through research and projects. And I would say all of those ideas are so abundantly visible in this exhibition. Next to Norman, we have Merle Mullen, who is the director and chairman of the Mullen Automotive Museum in Oxnard, California. Merle Mullen is here on behalf of both her and her husband, Peter, who um, have the Mullen Automotive M Museum, as I said, in California, and a very wide selection of automobiles that are um, historic and just breathtaking. Um, they have very generously lent 12 glass sculptures, uh, which are on view in some of our galleries by the uh, glass designer, Rene Lalique, uh, from the 1920s and 30s, two sculptures by Rembrandt Bugatti, and two sculptures, uh, two cars uh, from 1936 and 39, which are on view in the Sculptures Gallery. And finally, Philip Seraphim, who is a venture capitalist and investor, whose deep-rooted passions are evident in all as aspects of his business and personal life. Uh, Philip's investment portfolio spans technology and wellness with a focus on sustainability and health. He's an active philanthropist, heavily involved in bettering the lives of cancer survivors and furthering the educational needs of children. And he's also on the board of the Peterson Museum in Los Angeles, which is a museum dedicated to automotives. And, um, and you have lent two amazing cars, which we will talk about now. So. Now, let's get into the meat of the program. Um, I would like to start by asking you, Lord Foster, to just, before we talk about your selected vehicle this evening, would you just open by giving us an idea of where the concept for this exhibition came from? In a way, you've uh, already given the headlines in terms of breaking down the silos between so-called fine art, painting, sculpture, uh, objects, uh, automobiles, aircraft, uh, locomotives, um, film. Uh, uh, a holistic view of design is that, uh, that all of the activities, artistic activities, cultural activities, they're linked. They're linked culturally, visually, um, and in that holistic approach to seek to show some of the connections in this exhibition to uh, 
show how artists have anticipated ahead of time uh, the vehicles, the paintings. You can see a futurist painting of 1919 next to a BAT Alfa Romeo. And the forms are almost anticipatory, uh, identical, connecting the beginning of the 20th century with the middle of the 20th century. So, um, uh, and, uh, and also many of the things that we think are revolutionary of today to discover that the vehicle which the combustion, internal combustion engine is probably going to give way to a new age of mobility, which will be quieter, uh, very, very different. So in one sense, I described it as a requiem for this extraordinary age of combustion, which has changed the face of the planet like no other invention, and to discover perhaps that electrification was a serious competitor at the turn of the century when the car rescued the city from the pollution of the horse, from disease, stench, it beautified, it cleaned the city. Then it's become, in a way, the urban polluting villain, um, with another epoch, another wave to come. And at the turn of the century, we can see a uh, a vehicle which has electric motors embedded in the hubs, which was considered revolutionary when it became the lunar buggy. And so, uh, so I think there are many stories behind the, the exhibition. But as you say, the protagonists are the automobiles and they are stunningly beautiful. It's interesting that one of the, um, a noted curator in the 50s, described uh, automobiles as rolling sculpture. And I overheard one comment by one of the group uh, commissioned by the museum to move these vehicles around. And he made the comment that they were public sculptures, mm -hmm. which I thought was really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well, this, this exhibition really does sort of seek to uh, reposition or ask us to rethink the position of the car. We've talked, Averett, for example, about how uh, automobiles, even though they are these, uh, especially in, in, in the examples that we'll be talking about today, these exceptional uh, examples of design, industrial design, they are always thought about uh, in sort of a separate category from the art of the futurists or any of the other artworks that we will see in the exhibition. So it, it is kind of a wonderful um, ask, right, of the people that see this exhibition to be rethinking uh, the way that we, we consider these different disciplines within the arts and designs, which I think is one of the wonderful things about motion. I mean, uh, just w one passing comment, and that was made to me over lunch today, that this is a kind of once-in-a-lifetime exhibition. Mm -hmm. These vehicles will never be seen like this, ever. I mean, it's taken uh, extraordinary generosity on the part of individuals to sacrifice the loss of their loved ones for so long. <laughs> so yes, <laughs> yes, I think, I think we can be sure to say that this is a once in a lifetime <laughs> opportunity to see these things in, in discussion. Well, uh, Norman, you said something the other day that uh, stuck with me because you, you described a characteristic that I've um, observed in you, which is that you are, um, you said that you're passionately optimistic about the future. And, um, and I think that we see that throughout the exhibition and we see that in the vehicle that I think that you will be discussing with us today, which is the Dimaxion. So, um, I've got that now on the screen for our visitors to see. Would you tell us a little bit about um, your, your select vehicle that's, uh, that you've lent from your collection that's in the exhibition and serves as sort of a hub of discourse around the, uh, the maker of this vehicle? Well, why did I choose this vehicle? Um, many reasons, first of all, it's an absolutely spectacular object. I mean, if you could imagine the impact 
of this in 1933. You see this next to the boxy vehicles of that time. Um, and it's as if it's landed from outer space. If you took it on a road today, it would be a, a crowd stopper. You know, people would just stop in wonderment so many decades <coughs> later. And, um, and if they saw it doing something which probably no other vehicle can do, and that is, as well as turn corners, it can rotate in its own length. So it can park in a, in a bay which is just a few centimeters longer than its, than its length. Um, so main reason perhaps it's, it's amazing shape. Uh, it's just a very stunning, beautiful object. <coughs> but then it's an homage to Buckminster Fuller with whom I work with um, mentor, collaborator, and eventually friend for the last 12 years of his life. Um, so it pays homage. But Bucky was not the only designer of this vehicle. There were two other exceptional individuals. Isamo Noguchi, the Japanese-American artist, one of the great figures of the 20th century, um, uh, created inspirational objects which, uh, which in a way led the path for this vehicle. And then much more hands-on was a guy called uh, Starling Burgess, who was an aviation pioneer and also a designer of racing yachts. He created, I mean, his yachts won the America Cup three times. Um, and, um, and Bucky's maxim was about doing more with less. And, um, and his friend Henry Ford uh, said, you can have any Ford component for two thirds of the price at cost, more or less. And so he took the flathead V8, 75 horsepower, of the period, which would normally drive the standard sedan, the very boxy vehicle. And instead of putting it at the front, put it at the back. And then the differential is at the front and is driving the front wheels instead of the rear wheels. And like a boat, the rear wheel is like the tiller, the rudder, um, and, that, and that turns. And, um, and uh, reputedly, maybe with a degree of exaggeration, Bucky claimed to have reached 128 miles an hour That's hard in to this. Um, <laughs> and then he claimed that it, uh, that it would do 36 miles to the gallon. So, um, and, uh, and in a way, it anticipated the people mover that would come some decades later. So you can get a huge amount of stuff in it. I mean, it's big. So uh, you, when you compared the performance of this with the Ford sedan, it was you know, totally outperformed. I think it was very tricky to drive. Um, nobody was allowed to drive it unless they'd been kind of vetted and they'd really gone through it. It was reputedly somewhat unstable at, in crosswinds and so on. So I think it was, it was quite a challenging, although uh, one of the original three did something like 300,000 miles in its, in its lifetime. Um, and, um, and Bucky, always the visionary, the futurist, described it as an early stage in a vehicle, this would demonstrate its taxiing abilities because it anticipated uh, a Zoom-mobile. Uh, he called it 4D because, as he described to his daughter, um, eventually it would pave the way for something that, like a bird, would fly off into the sky on jet stilts, jet stilts. Um, uh, so he anticipated the jet engine maybe two decades before it became commercially viable. And if you look at the Harrier jump jet, which came in the 1960s, it's almost like in some way. And now, when we talk about mobility and we look at the startups and we look at drone technology, 
we realize that most likely mobility, air taxis in the future, are going to be 4D. They're going to be able to hover taxi. They're going to be able to. So, yes. in a way, um, Bucky was ever the visionary. But there's perhaps another story which is not appropriate now. Um, but I think um, Bucky always wanted to maintain his freedom to be able to do what he did. And just at the point where something was going to be commercially viable, he'd run away from it. So he had the freedom to... to I think that was true of this vehicle, and I think it was true of the Wichita House, um, where he harnessed the aircraft industry to demonstrate the potential of a, of a dwelling, an industrialized dwelling. Because as I say, that's another story. I hope that... Hmm long reasons why I chose that car. Well, so many of these, um, especially the vehicles, have a lot of stories, a lot of backstories. You really could spend an hour in one gallery and uh, dive into a lot of the discourses that we try to uh, illuminate through other uh, documentation. In the case of the Dimaxion, we have some wonderful historical footage of it being driven which kind of makes clear its capacity to operate in a very unique way, kind of spinning in circles. And um, anyway, Buckminster Fuller is such, was such a visionary and such a, an influential figure for so many artists and architects mm. and other thinkers. So it's uh, so befitting that it's the first thing that you see when you walk into our visionaries gallery and really fits this idea of uh, being very forward thinking, which is really what moves the exhibition. Um, I believe that we have here an image of, of your foundation in Madrid um, that I think also sheds some light on the way that you think about objects and the way that they relate to one another, um, the ways that different uh, artists' uh, work involve discourses that really cross disciplines um, so this is just sort of a peek into, I think, maybe what we could think of as your study that, y you know, you live with in, in Madrid and which we see play out on a larger scale here in the galleries. Well, there's a Buckminster Fuller solar house in the mid-ground, which mm -hmm. is... Uh, <laughs> I've forgotten the link between that and the earlier automobile. Yes. And, um, and in the background there is the actual voisin mm -hmm. that belonged to Le Corbusier and which um, featured in every photograph and many drawings of his projects of that period. And it is, um, interestingly, the voisin, voisin was primarily an aeronautical engineer. So the engineering, the construction is a pursuit of lightness, a very interesting connection with Fulham. And it's no accident that it's nicknamed the Lumineurs. Mm. And if you see it against the house, gosh, I mean, it's, it's, it's the horizontality of the, of the glazing. So there's a remarkable mm -hmm. affinity between that pioneering automobile and the modern architecture of that period. Absolutely. Mm. And this is another car that is in the exhibition, and we mm. have some photographs of that architecture, and it is quite remarkable the way that one mirrors the other. He was really thinking in a holistic manner. Averett, I would like to move on to you now and ask you about uh, the wonderful car, the Pegaso, that you've loaned to the exhibition and give you the opportunity to tell the story behind the Pegaso and how it came into your collection. Yeah, the Pegaso, we bought the car in 2004. We had a restoration work of more or less six years. And if you look at the car, it is so different. It's 1953, and it is so different from all the cars on the market in those years, so different from even the beautiful Italian cars. It has its own face. Such a courage what has been done at the factory to build this, factory, this car. 
it has so many different items on the car. First of all, it is a very long car. Sleek, long. Look at the rear window. The rear window is huge. Never ever an, a car factory has copied that. This is the only car who has such a big glass dome in the rear. Look at it, the small details. There's no door handle. There's only a button you push. Look at the size of the doors. That is what we call barrel doors, round. Too difficult to have sliding windows going up and down. So you had windows which went outside like an airplane. Look at the exhaust pipe just to show it to show that this car is powerful. Look at the color combination. What an art it is anyway. It is the Spanish color, yellow, but there should be some red too. So they painted the, uh, the wheels, the tires red. The only car who has that. It's so unique. And it was introduced in 53 at the New York Motor Show. And a very important man came there, the president of the Dominican Republic, Tujiro. Trujillo. Trujillo. Mm -hmm. I, Let's go. You see, I'm not Spanish. And he bought the car. He kept the car for 21 years. He was, yeah, killed or something like that. And then, where is the car? It was, n nobody could find the car. At a certain moment, a German collector found the car painted it silver. Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> you never have to change the color of a car. It should always be the same color from the birth on. And yeah, we got the car. We bought the car from this German guy. And then we took the restoration, which took about six years. We showed the car in America. May I tell that, that story? Yes, tell the story. Emotion. Everything of art, I think, is emotion. You feel it. And what happened? We had the car on the show. An older man in his 80s, maybe 90s, came to me and said, my goodness, now I see the car for the first time in real. He said, I was sent in the early days to a boarding school in England, and I was very homesick. I was, it was not happy. But my father sent popular signs, and on the front page, this yellow car was this Picasso was on the, uh, on the front page of the, that magazine. He put it under his writing desk. And when he was sad, he lifted the writing desk and he saw that yellow and he smiled. When he saw the car, he had tears in his eyes. Now, I, I think this... This shows that automobiles are more than only sculptures, that this has emotion. And that is our Picasso. Wonderful, I'm so proud that you <laughs> asked for me to bring it to here. But I'm so proud that you lent it. Oh, lovely. <laughs> we all are, aren't we? <laughs> I, 
I, I do really love the detail of this uh, triumph of design that was produced here in Spain in a very difficult political moment where there was such restriction on creativity in 1953. And it is a one of a kind. There are no other Pegasos like this in the world. And, and we have it here. It's just so fabulous. And it's so fittingly in uh, the gallery that we call Sculptures uh, for a very good reason. So we look forward to um, everyone enjoying it. And I'm going to now show a picture of your museum, ah, which yeah. looks beautiful. Would you like to say a word about this? Yeah, uh, we have a museum. Uh, you just mentioned th the automobile has changed more than anything else in the world. And it deserves a museum and we show cars from the very early 1880s till, let's say, 100 years later. But from everything, something. And what I like is that we have, for instance, the first hybrid car in the world, 1896, that had even an electric starter. Later on, Packard said, or Cadillac said in 1912 that they had the first electric starter. It's not correct. <laughs> <laughs> I love to change the, the documentation to be correct. <laughs> we have the first six cylinder car. We have a Dutch product, Spiker, which is in six cylinder, the first six cylinder in the world but it also had a four-wheel drive. Mm. And it had four-wheel brakes. Also the first six of uh, four-wheel brake and four-wheel drive. We show the cars preferable unrestored. We have a collection of cars before 1900, which still has the original leather the original paint that is that shows the the age of the car that gives that atmosphere that you feel it it's wonderful even if a tire is maybe flat i don't mind we keep it because it's the original tire of 1890 yeah i can go on we love <laughs> We, we all we take note, we, we need art. to travel, yes, and, and <laughs> see this in person. It looks extraordinary. Well, we are going to stay in our sculptures gallery for another extraordinary example of a rolling sculpture, which Merle, I would like for you to talk about. I understand that the Delahaye is very special to you. Well, uh, as a family, in families, one never has a favorite child, or at least never admits that they have a favorite child. <laughs> but we have lots of children. They're all very nice, but this unequivocal, unequivocally is my favorite, and has been my favorite since I encountered it uh, about, uh, I think, 26 years ago. Um, I inherited my love for cars from my husband, who is very, I'm sorry, <laughs> he's not well right now, so I'm sorry, but he's very passionate um, about these cars, and when he described this car to me, and I first encountered it, he said, look, look at these fenders, they're so voluptuous, <laughs> and just look and feel the, the back, the rear, he called it, and so I said, I, I never quite heard anybody speak about a car that way. <laughs> I thought, well, that's a very interesting way, and I had just met my husband, and um, he took me to see this car, which was then at the Peterson Museum on the third day after I met him, and I would say it was a coup de food, but meaning love at first sight. <laughs> I don't know if it was him or the car. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was him, but <laughs> but the car came with him, so that was the good news. But I, I <laughs> but I, I think what I what I find fascinating about this car is that 
um, it's kind of like a rescue car. It's a rescued orphan because it was built in 1938 for the World's Fair. There were only two built. I think Franz might be in the room. Someone who's here this week is restoring the second one. So this car was sent to the World's Fair in 1939, where it won the best in show. It, there was such a shortage of time to get the car ready that they kept um, the engine to work on it, uh, further work on the engine, it stayed in France. So they built a shell inside of the car, in the front of the car, to m uh, imitate the engine. So there was never an engine in it, but it, they did engine turnings, if you know what those are, the engine scrapings on the firewall in the front so that it would appear that there was an engine in it. The show lasted, the World's Fair lasted a lot longer than they thought, and the, um, the Hitler had invaded France, and it was 1939. They knew they could not send the car back. The title of the car, in fact, was blurry because they weren't sure who actually owned the car, and so they kept the car here, they put it in storage where it stayed for probably eight or 10 years until a, a man from California saw it and decided to put it in his collection. He outfitted it with a Chrysler engine, a very large, very powerful Chrysler engine. He took it to Los Angeles and it had a journey from there. It ended up in Honolulu where it was seen by a lieutenant who was in the uh, US Army in Hawaii. And he wanted this car very badly. He bought the car, I think, for $1,200. I think it went up in value a little bit. A little then. bit. <laughs> and, um, and he kept it for a certain amount of time, and then it went to a car dealer in Beverly Hills. From there, n it, it, it was neglected, and it became a not a desirable car. It's still the engine was in Europe. Meanwhile, the car is in Los Angeles. The engine went to a collector, Count von Dunhoff, in, who had the, was given the chance to buy this engine. He did. He then was always calling my husband to see if he knew where the body was because he said, I have the engine for this car. Where is the missing body? In the meantime, we were showing Adela Hay in, at a car, Concorde d'Elegance in Pebble Beach. And it was being judged when someone came up to my husband and said, I, have, I know a guy who has a car like this with those covered wheels. And he lives in Fresno and we were being judged at the time. So my husband said, would you mind coming back? The man did not come back. And uh, probably a few months later, all of a sudden, this came to light, and my husband said, well, maybe, maybe that is the engine for the body. So he went, uh, and he went, maybe that's the body. See, we drove to Fresno, and they had spotted it next to a yellow tow truck near, an, near the airport. Fresno, California is a very unattractive and small town with a very small airport. So in driving around, Peter and his partner drove around. They found the yellow tow truck. There peeking out was this fender that looked like it could be the Delahaye. It was the Delahaye. It had been sitting in the back of a, I don't know how you would say it in, in Spanish, but the tow truck, uh, a tow truck uh, That's business. okay, it's being translated. Uh, all right, and um, the... Peter recognized it immediately that this was the missing Delahaye. Mm -hmm. And so he offered the woman, he said, you know, I was told by your friend that this car is in your way. It's very big. <laughs> he says, I'll, I'll be happy to take it off your hands for you. I'll even pay for the transportation to Los Angeles. And the man was ready to say yes, but he said, I, I'll discuss it with my wife, which he did. And the wife said, if 
someone wants this car, we're going to do some research on it. And five years later, we got the car. And, and really, and seven years after that, the restoration was finished. And we found red was the original color. When you're right, it, uh, uh, Avert, you're right. The, the car should be restored to its original color. It, the pigskin seats, we found tiny scraps in parts of the engine. The car was hollow. You could stand at the back and look straight through it. There was no chassis or anything in it. And now you can see it for yourself, close up, how beautiful it is. So I'm, we're very proud to have it here at the museum because we do feel that cars are art. And we're, we're involved with the Guggenheim Museum in Venice, and we're so thrilled that, that you asked us to bring it here. <laughs> well, the Delahaye absolutely embodies the idea of both sculpture but also glamour. It is just an absolutely stunning car. And we thought nothing could beat your other loan, the Bugatti Atlantic, which is also totally glamorous and sculptural. So the two, along with the Pegaso and something else, uh, in the sculpture gallery really make quite a tremendous uh, room. So we are going to, oh, actually, I think we've got one picture here um, of other cars from your collection. I don't know if you want to say a quick word before we pass the... Oh, well, we, we um, in 2011, we opened a museum because the eight cars that my husband started with grew to quite a few more. He thought that was it, and we needed to expand. So we built this museum, which is, our collection is uh, cent centers on French cars from the, the late 1800s to the 1950s, I'd say, late, late 1959. So you here in our museum in Oxnard, California, it's an hour north of Los Angeles, we have uh, rotating exhibits, and this this is the particular exhibit that's on right now, which is the exhibit of the the best carrossiers who designed cars. They were the body builders of the time, and th this is what's on view right now at uh, at the Mullen Automotive Museum. Beautiful. This looks like another destination that we all need to take note of. So we, we're going to fast forward 30-something <coughs> years from the Delahaye uh, as we move to Philip Sloan. And um, <laughs> you can see that we move to back to the future, to the Visionaries Gallery, for this fantastic car, which, Philip, I would love for you to talk about. Well, the uh, Stratos Hero, the launcher Stratos Hero, has a very special place in my heart. And it represents and encapsulates a moment in history so successfully to me. Um, it's a clear illustration that cars are not just a means of transportation. They're the intersection of so many parts of the human endeavor and encapsulate all faculties of study. Art, architecture, um, engineering, design, social history, and a few other forms of design can claim that. Um, I, uh, I'd like to take a moment to take a step back into 1969 uh, when this car was designed. It was launched in 1970, um, but one of the greatest things about these cars is the, the context in which, which is often overlooked in other exhibitions and shows around the world, but to me is of paramount importance. Um, and that's what excited me so much about Lord Foster's exhibition. The world that created and influenced such designs is now gone, so the car serves as a cultural portrait of the zeitgeist. Um, in the late 60s, early 70s, the US military was entrenched in Vietnam. Hundreds of thousands of forward thinkers were enticed by the likes of Woodstock um, the space race had culminated in the moon landing, and the world was staring into their television sets, um, watching humans traveling to the stars. The global view was full of revolution, 
social change and a hopefulness that was focused on new technologies and new worlds. So this Stratos with its celestial title and spaceship aesthetics was the product of all of this. And I'm cited, happy to say that it's been cited as inspiration to so many great designers. Um, in this period of time, you had an incredible competitive world of coach building in Torino. You had Bertone, which produced the Zero. You had Ital Design, uh, led by Jujaro, which produced the Maserati Boomerang and the Volkswagen Porsche Tapiro. Um, and uh, you had Pininfarina, which created the Modulo. In, uh, at the end of 1969, you had a race to see how low you could go. Pininfarina came out with the Modulo, an unbelievable 36 inches in height. Um, next unveiled was Gandini's Strato Zero, which had a height of 33 inches and um, is just an incredible packaging exercise. When I look at all of these concept cars, um, what's so important to me is that it's all about the what ifs and experimentation and trying to do things differently and look at the world differently. Um, for Gandini, uh, in the 60s, he introduced the Lamborghini Miura, um, which at that point was classical design. And then he had the Marzal, where he began entering more into geometric design. Um, and the Zero, um, well, and then he had the Carabo, and then he was truly a superstar. And the Zero, I think, represented you know, the beginning of the wedge era and um, a shape that is present and futuristic and in something uh, that created a new way of design. Um, and um, <clears throat> I think what's so important to me about the Zero is that concept cars are, are incubators for the future. And my profession and passion is looking for the future. I look at the Stratos here on other concepts and the shapes, designs, drivetrains, seating positions, packaging exercises is all about the what ifs. And you do not have to accept the conventions of the past to be successful in the future. Um, I hope that these concept cards reframe the thinking of students and educators as they walk through the exhibit and ask themselves the what if questions. Um, what if you could design a better future? What if you could bring travel and mobility to all in a safer and cleaner way? More importantly, what sort of future do you want to design? I hope that the future is reverent and irreverent, collaborative, bold, and playful, one where we're all encouraged to express and participate in a meaningful and healthy way. It's an honor to be with you all. Thank you so much for including me. Oh. The optimism for the future is very refreshing. We are in challenging times, and uh, it's, it's nice to be able to think about uh, some of these objects and the way that they can open themselves up to different kinds of futures, which is, of course, the way that the exhibition ends. You'll all have to go see the Futures Gallery for yourself. Um, I do want to show, Philip, I want to talk about two details uh, with this car, which I think that we can see in the far part of the, do we, where do we see your Delancia? Um, it opens. Just behind the disco ball. Okay. Behind the Okay, the disco power. ball. Locate the Found disco that. ball, and then down <laughs> from there you see a flash of orange, and you also see a large uh, silver uh, fan coming up off the car. Do you want to talk about how the car opens? I mean, it's really, to look at this, maybe it doesn't seem so mysterious on screen, but when you see the car in person, you're going to ask how one could possibly get into something so low. It's about this high. You want to talk about how it opens up? Yes, yeah, so, um, so uh, the seating position of the car is, is one which are recumbent, and you access the car through the windshield, and the windshield acts as a door, so it opens 
and um, there's a hydraulic system which lifts the steering wheel, and then you get in and you sit down in these chocolate bar seats. Um, the engine lid is designed after the cross section of an aircraft wing. And to me, it's one of the most architectural shapes I've seen in an automobile. It looks like something that could be designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, could have been. And um, uh, it is uh, a cooling effect. So it is a functional um, engine lid that provides cooling to the engine which is a 1.6 liter Lancia HF motor. Um, the car is based on a Lancia Fulvia chassis and um, the 1.6 HF is a motor that uh, you could attribute over 200 rally wins to and there's over 10,000 mechanics in Italy that are very familiar with it, so it's quite Amazing. A common I didn't plan. understand all of that, but um, <laughs> surely <laughs> some but, of our more technologically inclined guests but did. Philip, you drive this, don't you? I, I do, mean, I do. And, and, uh, and when what, I drive what sort, it... What sort of reactions do you get? I mean, it, when you were talking about driving the Dymaxion, it's very much the same thing. I mean, it's like walking around with, with a TV remote, and you can hit pause and watch the world <laughs> stop. Right. I mean, it truly Amazing. is a spaceship. I mean, just, just like all of the cars uh, that have been lent to this exhibition. Yeah, I can, I can imagine actually accidents occurring around something <laughs> like either, either of those cars, but really any of the four, or as you said, any of the cars in the exhibition. They're so unique. And you, you lent one other that is equally unique that we took turns crawling into this morning called the Minissima. Minissima. We don't have a picture of it, but it's a, a teeny tiny concept car um, that's in our popularizing gallery, and um, we, we have the back open to display the unique way that one gets in and out, which is one of the wonderful things about some of these concept cars is that they, they present ideas that maybe, maybe don't take hold or they don't take hold right away, but they're putting the ideas out there for us to, to think about and move into other designs and realms. That's an extraordinary car. I mean, the, the, this tiny, I mean, it is, the length is the width of an automobile, typical car. So you back it up at 90 degrees to the pavement and get out of the back directly <laughs> onto the pavement. And, and, and I think the, the other thing for me is that I saw images of that, I saw photographs, but when I saw the real thing in that gallery, I it just blew my mind. I mean, it's just such a, an incredible piece of design, and you look inside it as well. It's absolutely extraordinary, and um, uh, and so much more than the photograph. Uh, but that's true of any of these. It really cars. is. You really have to see them in the round. This is true. Well, we have uh, gotten through what I really wanted us to be able to talk about today. Um, we wanted to reserve some time uh, for questions also, in case uh, I'm, I'm sure that there are questions for the participants. Um, you're welcome to ask questions in English or Spanish. If it's too technical in Spanish, I might have trouble translating, but um, they would be very happy to take your questions at this point in the program. Hey, my, my best. <laughs> so there are some drawings of Frank Lloyd Wright drawings. Um, he modified some models. I, I remember there are some four modifications of Frankly right. Do you, Norman Foster, have ever dreamed about modifying some car or maybe design the shape of some car or some attempts or whatever? Your own design, I mean? Um, I've done many sketches of cars, but I've never designed a car <coughs> as such beyond, um, <coughs> beyond a concept sketch. Um, but um, your reference 
to Frank Lloyd Wright <coughs> is, is, is interesting for me in two respects. First of all, he was a passionate car buff. I mean, apparently owned in his lifetime 80 different cars. And, <coughs> and the Guggenheim, its spiral, <coughs> the Guggenheim, um, New York. Was, was in New York, was um, anticipated by his projects for, I think it was Strong, mm -hmm. a guy called Strong. <coughs> and um, and the, in one of the galleries, you can see the, um, the designs. And there's a, uh, so in a way, uh, the, the ideas bubbling around, <coughs> inspired by motor ramps, and perhaps the ramps of um, the <coughs> Linjotto uh, mm -hmm. building of the 20s in Turin. Um, so there's, a, I, I think, a very, very interesting connection there. And, um, and, um, and, and I think as, as architects, we, we, you know, we influence each other either consciously or subconsciously. So when, <coughs> when we were putting together the exhibition, it seemed logical to pair that with, um, with a drawing where I show the, the ramp in the, in the Bloomberg building, which is a, a pedestrian ramp at the heart of it. So, um, so I think that the, you know, your, your reference to Frank Lloyd Wright is, is interesting in that uh, we're all, in a way, like Frank Lloyd Wright was himself, influenced by, uh, by others. Mm -hmm. We have some other examples in the exhibition that <coughs> very much relate to what you're asking about, uh, a car that was designed by Corbusier. Um, it's actually a wooden sculpture. It was never realized as a car. Uh, but we see his interest in, in that. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright also uh, in, in what you mentioned. And, um, oh, there was one more. Oh. Also, some amazing drawings by Giacometti and, uh, and some others by Corbusier, thinking about the influence, but also the structure of car, the designs of different cars. So um, it's certainly something that many architects have, have thought about. Any other questions? Hi, St Stephen Murphy with the Richard Rehouse Collection in Chicago. First of all, thank you for coming to my hometown to, to open this uh, wonderful exhibition. It's shaping up to be really good. Um, I'm wondering if, you, if any of our panelists can speak to the challenges of, uh, of owning and enjoying and operating their um, automobiles. Thank you. <coughs> challenges of owning and driving. Mm -hmm. I can lead by saying that I can take any of the cars in our collection and drive them on the road and it's perfection. If my wife steps into that car, that car is going to misbehave. No. <laughs> uh, and I can give you just so many examples. I mean, we went for a romantic lunch to a restaurant on Lake Geneva in the Gullwing Mercedes, and it was incredible. But when we got in the car to come back, the horn decided to act independently, and it okay. started to, but it chose traffic lights when you were in the middle of a group of cars, and the traffic lights were on red, and it would start the horn, and <laughs> so it was the most, <laughs> so, uh, uh, I have a mixture of, uh, of experiences with driving <laughs> classic cars. It's better that I drive them on my own. <laughs> well, I, I will say, is this working? I, I will yes. say that we go on lots of rallies, and we, I learned to understand, do not anticipate that you're going to finish this rally, that you'll get to one of, and rallies people started at Destinate, they, have a starting point and a destination, but along the way, many stops for special events and special lunches. Well, we are usually the only ones who never make it to the special lunches because something inevitably happens with those cars. They're sensitive, they're old, but they really are, 
fun to drive. Um, I hope this doesn't sound chauvinistic or anything, but we, when I go on a rally, with my, when I'm driving, I take a German car or an, or an English car, not one of our French cars. <laughs> 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 What's your favorite car to drive, Merle? Someone asked me that question, and I would just have to say the car I'm driving at the moment is my favorite you have car. Favorites? I like to drive them all. They're really fun. I was telling the story that we, we have this uh, Citroen uh, DS19 um, Cabriolet, and I was very excited to drive it, and I was invited to go somewhere that was... Of, of the Rose Bowl. I think everyone knows the Rose Bowl here. And, and we were to park our cars on the lawn. It was a fundraiser. So it was a long, long way. And coming home, I had to wear a miner's band around with a flashlight right here, mid forehead. And I learned that whenever I drive that car at night, that's what I have to do because the lights are so dim on the dashboard <laughs> <laughs> that you, you and oh, the, that's a car that's a manual transmission. But there's no, there's, uh, there's no shifting. You shift with your feet. You talk to it a little bit. And then you move something on the uh, steering handle. But you, you, you sacrifice the comfort, all the bells and whis whistles. You, know? mm -hmm. you can't connect it to your phone. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's better. <laughs> Maybe we need to go back to the past for, the, for that reason. I think it's always <laughs> important to carry a good book if you're uh, interested in vintage motoring, <laughs> uh, because you might find yourself uh, in unexpected uh, circumstances on the side of the road. And duct tape. And duct tape is always important. That's good. Do you have any anecdotes now, that you would like to I believe include? You are freely to drive this. And May I call it the classic car. But you have to have a lot of respect for the car. It's an older car. It's an older person. And you don't want to damage the gearbox, the brakes, or something else. Of course, you can replace it or repair it. But oh, the car would be much nicer <laughs> when you don't have to repair it. So you have to be very careful. <coughs> and there are, of course, rallies. And I did with, my, with our Mercedes SSK about 10 millimillias with a big compressor, very fast, very powerful. But you have to be very careful that you don't damage it. Uh, the older I'm getting, the more I say, let's be careful. We have to keep our cars for the f next generations. That is one of our thinking also in our museum. We want to keep them for the next generation. We want to keep our museum 200 years from now still open. Be careful. Let's handle them like our children. Um, that's the right word, our children. We're talking about vintage cars and we're talking about the future of mobility. But how do we secure the future of vintage cars? So looking forward, not only backwards. And they're the key, are the children. And how do we get youngsters passionate about the car so we create future custodians? Because there will be a day in 200 years we are not around anymore but we need people, passionate people, to take care of the cars. And if we don't let children and youngsters get in touch with those cars, they will never create an emotion. So what are we doing? What can we do to foster future people? May I? Please. It's a great question. I think it is possible. For that, we have a museum. For that, we educate the younger people. For that, we try to instruct and to show what the car has done also in the history. Let's, 
let's talk about the history. I don't want to talk too much about it, but about the Volkswagen Beetle. You can tell the whole story. Ferdinand Porsche was a big friend from Adolf Hitler. Nobody knows that, but you only can instruct them and to tell them. You can tell so much about the history. I think it's so exciting. We need teachers for that. And that is what we try to do in our museum. And really, we were looking for a new mechanic. We got so much applied people who want to go from that modern cars with electronics to the real combustion engine cars. We love the sound of the cars. And it is like music. We still love the music from Tchaikovsky, <coughs> which is a long time ago. Maybe. I'd like to have a go at answering that. I agree with you totally. Also, it's about museums and exhibitions. Um, oh, sorry. But no, no. Well, you could say both. 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 But, both. We are both. With but I wanted. I wanted. I wanted to share with the audience, if I may, uh, a little anecdotal background to the questioner. Fritz Burkhardt has lent for this exhibition the uh, original DB5 with all the gadgets, uh, which is next to the film playing with James Bond driving that car and the glamorous lady in the Mustang and all the gadgets. Um, but, but Fritz lives that world. And if you really want communication of that world, I'll describe very, very quickly. Um, it's the Lake of St. Moritz. It's frozen. There's a circuit because they've been using it for horse racing. It's a closed circuit. It's icy and it's snowy. And Fritz turns up like James Bond in this snowy day in evening dress, uh, holding a gun. And we get into this DB5. And there's coming behind us a vintage Italian police car and Fritz drives into this circuit, and we're going round, and at one point, um, because when he fires the pistol, he needs to press a little button, the bottom left, to make the sound of the, uh, of the pistol firing. So we're going down this straight. We're probably doing about 100 kilometers an hour. Fritz is leaning out of the window, firing at the police car, his other hand is pressing the button to make the noise, and I suddenly realize the steering wheel is all on its own, and we're going <laughs> down this kind of icy, snowy circuit. So, uh, so I think Fritz is a great communicator to generations to come by doing what he does with the cars. And so this unbelievably valuable automobile is... Uh, you know, earns its living, just uh, amazing. I would say one more thing is that um, it's important to educate and expose younger people to these cars. And our experience has been that they have really, they take to the cars, we have them come to the museum often. And Peter and I decided to be instrumental in um, creating the Mullen School of Transportation Design at Art Center College, which is one of the best colleges in the United States for, for, uh, for auto, I was going to say automobile design. When we started that six years ago, and it was on the drawing boards, it was called the Mullen School of Automotive Design. But it's completely changed because now, like you, it's the Mullen School of Transportation Design. Because I have sat in a flying car last week at the Peterson Automotive Museum and the, with fold wings that fold down. It's a concept at this point. It's a little out of people's price range. <laughs> at a million, a million, <laughs> how, not, well, how much was that car? I, uh, just Did over you? a million, I think. Over a million. Yeah. It'll be out of people's price range. But like the first I, iPhones, you know, they will become, it might actually become a standard. 
But I think educating young children, and that school offers at least 60% of their student body is on scholarship. So it's, it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. They are going to stay interested. And they have vintage cars, and they refer to them. You know, when you spoke about not borrowing from the past to understand the future. You know, we, we have a car at the museum that was the designed by the students at Art Center to be the body that uh, a young man named Jean Bugatti, who was one of the best, Jean Bugatti designed the other car that we have on loan, which is uh, the Bugatti Atlantic, the blue one that sits across the way from this red car. And Jean Bugatti was killed in a uh, crash when he was in his 30s. So we acquired the chassis, but we never, it didn't have a body. And the contest was to Art Center. And we had some of the most exquisite designs. And we did make the design. It's all um, titanium. The whole car is titanium, and it won't be painted. And it's a great project. And th when young people come to the museum, they are fascinated by the old cars. So we hope that they're going to continue this, this tradition. And Art Center Pasadena, of course, is yes. one of the 15 schools in the Future mm -hmm. Gallery. Yes. I know that there are more questions, and I wish we had more time, but this is the end of our program. So please join me in uh, thanking our participants tonight, and we hope you enjoy the exhibition. <laughs> That's such a fascinating story.